Hi, hi, morning, everybody. Sorry about that slight delay to starting. A uh, little bit of technical issues, getting the PowerPoint up and running. So I'm just going to bring this up now and share my screen with everybody. Okay, Ravina, can you just give me a thumbs up that you can see that as a full screen? Excellent. Okay. So, hi, thanks for everybody. This is a present webinar by Regulatory Services Partnership. Um, we will be talking about close contact sector today. Um, bit of the small print at the beginning, speakers' views are speakers alone. You'll hear a bit of the uh, signs behind virus transmission, efficacy of face coverings. That will hopefully then make the guidance that you've read and what we say today a little bit more uh, sense out of that. This is English law, although saying that it, the rules are fairly similar to similar across the different regions, um, although there is some subtle difference to dates of uh, reopening. So this will be recorded and been going uh, out on the internet. So you may be a business that's viewing this in other area. That's something that you need to bear in mind. Mention of or participation by any business or body during the webinar doesn't necessarily amount to um, uh, any uh, recommendation by the council and uh, as I say the webinar will be recorded a few other things uh, just to say to you there'll be a few council op officers today to answer questions so basically we'll be running through some content and then there'll be an FAQ at the end where you can ask the officers and or the industry rep those questions um, all attendees other than the panel are muted at the moment so after the initial presentation there'll be an opportunity for you guys to ask your questions. If you want to ask a question, just raise your virtual hand. Um, and if you do speak, it'd be good uh, if you could turn your camera on. Please also use a chat function if you want to share any views throughout the discussion, and those will get picked up. Hopefully, we'll try and answer all questions today, but if there's anything that's left unanswered, we will uh, try to come back to that in the follow-up information that we send through. So, a little bit about us, um, Regulated Services partnership, partnership, we cover three different London boroughs. Uh, there's over 50 staff covering all the regulatory services that you will come into contact with. And um, just to, to uh, obviously we cover lots of things, but COVID has been on our uh, list of regulations the past year. Um, there has been various uh, concerns from business. And, and this is something that's, you know, been around for years is about if you haven't had any interactions with a regulator before, um, you know, you may uh, be um, in two minds whether to ring up for advice, uh, a bit unsure about what the, uh, the repercussions is and what the attitude of enforcement is. So just to kind of put your mind at ease that, and this goes across for every regulator, and this is nationally that, 99.9% .9 of every interaction we have with business is about giving advice. You know, we are there to support businesses, get things right. So if you're unsure about anything, uh, guidance or the law doesn't make any sense, you know, contact your uh, local environment health and we'll try and uh, give you, help you out. So the speakers today are myself, Paul Maloshevsky reed I'm in Trade and Standards. We've got uh, Rina Pirval, who's our Health and Safety Inspector. Uh, we've also got Alex Wilson Wilkins, who is the medical liaison at the UK's Association of Professional Piercers, to give you a, an industry slant on these new rules. So, as a um, rough outline, it's going to be about 30 minutes of content, 40 minutes maybe tops. So you'll hear about the science, you'll hear about practical steps to reduce risk in your premise. You'll, we'll touch on government and trade association guidance face coverings, visors, um, some tips, practical tips on things to think about to get customers to come back, signpost you to the financial and other support that's available for you and your employees, and then Q&A at the end. So the virus in a, a nutshell, um, obviously this is new to everybody, including uh, you know those in the science community and government. So. There was a lot of uh, changes as the science evolved and everybody understood more about this virus that then changes the, the kind of advice that we provide. So essentially the virus uh, is mainly spread around through aerosols when we're talking, we're breathing out. 
those tiny little aerosols can float around for hours because they, those tiny ones don't just drop straight to the floor. Um, this is why ventilation is so key. Um, surface transmission was talked about a lot in that initial few months. You'll remember all the scares around, uh, you know, uh, the virus is live on different surfaces up to three days. Therefore, we all need to clean, clean. Um, what we know now is that there's been no scientific uh, evidence of that internationally, that, it's, that anybody has transmitted the virus through surfaces. And whilst three days is possible, uh, for a virus to stay alive in a lab conditions, that is uh, an artificial setting where it's in a lab, it's a lot of the virus uh, put onto a surface, and also it was kept within an aqueous solution that helped preserve the virus, which is very different if somebody sneezed, coughed, and those droplets were on a surface and exposed to the air. So the virus uh, will last a lot, uh, uh, will, will die off in a lot shorter time, uh, than that in a normal environment. And also what they've said is the other reason it's virtually impossible is because you would have to have a scenario where somebody has sneezed, coughed, and enough of that virus landed on a surface. And then second person would have to come along within half an hour to an hour, uh, sorry, within a one or two hours and touch that surface. They would then have to touch their face and breathe in enough of the virus to overwhelm the immune system. And because of all of those steps that would have to happen, the amount of virus and the short space of time we're talking before a second person comes along, this is why uh, you'll see a lot uh, in the scientific community saying the risk is negligible, if not impossible. And this is why you'll see some centers uh, of disease, uh, sorry, centers of disease in different government agencies around different countries saying that they don't see that as a route to transmission anymore. So, why that, that's relevant to yourself, two things really. Um, the idea of excessive uh, cleaning excessively is probably uh, not uh, required now. Normal standard cleaning and hand washing, yes, of course, is good for basic hygiene uh, purposes. Uh, things, questions that we've had in the past about can we offer magazines, can we leave things out in the waiting area? That also uh, has changed. I would say that based upon what we know of the science now, there isn't that risk that we thought uh, of a year ago by leaving things out uh, in a waiting area. And there wouldn't be a need uh, to uh, you know, st uh, sterilize certain things like that because somebody's touched it. So you cannot pass the virus just from somebody touching something. It needs to be that they've had the virus, you know, they've sneezed or coughed in the hand and then you've touched the surface and all of the reasons I've just given uh, previously why it's unlikely that would cause transmission. Um, outdoors is low risk. So uh, virus aerosol particles are diluted very quickly just by a, a gentle breeze. Even in scenarios like crowded beaches, which got a lot of media attention, uh, one of the SAGE government advisors said that even in a crowded uh, situation outdoors, um, because there's so much uh, fresh air, uh, sorry, I'll just switch it off. Because there's so much fresh air, it very quickly dilutes the particles, making it a very low risk scenario. The other thing uh, to bear in mind is even if we had the risk of uh, surface uh, transmission, 90% of coronavirus particles are are killed off within seven minutes of sunlight. We've had questions previously about whether we should therefore buy these UV light sterilizers that you might have seen online. Most of those are scams. Um, there is no safe UV light sterilizers on the market that you can put up in your premise to sterilize the air inside your premise uh, because the very uh, rays that kill off the virus are also harmful to humans. Now that's completely different from um, closed UV cubicles that you sterilize cones and, uh, and other equipment in. That is uh, safe because it's closed off. So um, this is why you would have seen in the guidance over the past year, things about moving business outdoors, um, this alfresco dining, everybody moving outdoors, waiting areas outdoors. 
not something that's simple to do in cold when it's cold, but as the, the weather warms up, it's something that you can think about. You might have the option to buy one of these fast track pavement licenses from your local authority. Um, those are do only cover certain sectors, so have a look at that. Um, not every sector and every kind of business uh, scenario was covered by those pavement licenses. If you feel your sector would like uh, to benefit from those and the, the legislation doesn't currently allow you to, um, contact your trade association. They are there to have those conversations with the relevant government departments on your behalf to make those kind of changes. Now that pavement license aside, some councils have kind of just gone out of their way to do certain things like uh, restrict roads, open up roads to alfresco uh, dining, um, regardless of these pavement uh, licenses. That is something over and above uh, those licenses that were brought in. So again, those are kind of conversations that businesses can have with, um, with their councillors. It is different from area to area. Uh, so I'm very conscious as I'm saying this, we are covering three boroughs. Um, and uh, different councils will have different uh, abilities to do certain things depending on the roads and, and, and pavements and options for uh, rerouting re buses, cars, etc. So it's not always possible. So there's lots of rules. It's all new to everybody. It's a bit of a minefield trying to make sense of it all, uh, including us. This was as new to us as it was to yourself. Now, something I found very helpful, um, uh, and I recommend this as a kind of first place to start for businesses, is to go to this URL that you see on the slide. You tap in a answer about five, six questions about business sector, size of business, and that then gives you a list of all the guides that are relevant to you. Now, you want, sometimes you need to look at different guides. So you may be a close contact business and you would think, well, I just need to look at the close contact guy. But you may also have aspects or certain employees that do remote working, you know, go out and do um, provide the services in people's homes. So there's a guide for that. There's separate guidance on face coverings. So there's a few, there might be three, four different documents that you need to look at to get the full picture. This will give you the list of all of them that's relevant to you by filling in these couple of questions. Once you've looked at that, you may still have questions. Some, there are some areas that are a bit gray and it can be difficult to interpret some things because these rules are new. Um, that is where uh, you, know, you can contact your local authority to get some idea of what the rules mean and how you practically implement them. The other thing that's worth doing is each trade association for sectors has typically created their own uh, guides, uh, their own sets of FEQs to try and make it easier and more uh, personalised to their sector. So have a look at uh, what your trade body's got on their website. Um, one of the key things to do is a risk assessment. And my there is a template that will be circulated in the information that follows up. And my colleagues are going to talk about risk assessment a bit. Uh, more detail later. Um, all I'll say is it's something that's unique to you. And when you think about risk assessment, think about the customer's journey, you know, before they come, when they're at the premise, when they're waiting, during the service, uh, and how uh, and when they leave. Uh, and that will help you think about all the, the things and, and potential risks or pinch points on premise. Now, good ventilation is the priority um, for reducing risk indoors. There's been, this is the advice coming out of SAGE and that's based upon a number of things. One uh, study that they quoted that I th thought was, you know, uh, made quite an, Im an impact to me when I read it was, there was uh, tuberculosis in a university in another country. This again is also an airborne virus. And they found there was, it was poorly ventilated inside this university and just only by changing the ventilation and bringing it under, uh, making the ventilation very good, they found reduced uh, virus uh, transmission by 97%. Now, you cannot, there isn't a bit of equipment that you can just go into room and measure how, um, sorry, bear with me a moment, something came through, I just want to make sure that's not one of my other colleagues uh, texting me. Okay, so um, 
one of the things you can't go in with a bit of equipment to see how many virus particles are in the air. But what you can do is you can measure the amount, level of CO2. And that is a good, very good indicator of how much ventilation um, is in a property. So they found that if you have the CO2 levels uh, below 1,000, that is a good indication of good ventilation. And that is when they found this very, very significant reduction in transmission between university staff and, and pupils, etc. Now, that is in a university. So that's obviously in, a, in an environment where people are around, you know, for hours uh, around each other. So... If they were able to do that in that environment, you can imagine how helpful it is in environments where people are there for 15 minutes, 30, or even an hour. Now, there's been confusion around mitigation when that came out, so let's just remind ourselves what those rules were about. Um, government started off with this two meter rule, uh, uh, and that was based upon the, the initial thinking that transmission is mostly when people cough and sneeze, and those droplets typically dropped within a two meter radius. And also as science evolved, the thinking also was even if um, we believed it's mostly caused by aerosol transmission when people talk, et cetera, then it, as long as you're two meters away, that will give enough time for the air in between you and the other person to dilute those particles that the other person would breathe in. So, they dropped that to one meter plus and what they said is you can be one meter away as long as there's other things that help to reduce um, the uh, risk of transmission. Now there's two key factors uh, when we're thinking about transmission. One is viral load. So just being next to somebody a meter or two meters away even if they're breathing out the virus does not mean to say that you will get it. It's all about how much virus you breathe in it needs to be so much that it overwhelms the immune system. So that's one thing. Time is a critical factor because obviously the longer you're near somebody, um, the more you're breathing in those particles. Now we're asked, so how long is too long? Well, for track and trace purposes, they, they look at uh, whether you've been near somebody face to face for 15 minutes or more. So less than two meters away for 15 minutes or more. So that's the point that they start to get a bit concerned. Um, give you some more context when gyms were allowed to reopen and SAGE and Public Health England looked at the measures gyms would put in place, whether that would avoid uh, gym users having to wear face coverings, they looked at ventilation. And they said, as long as the ventilation was a certain level, um, that would be sufficient to uh, avoid having to wear face coverings and still have a uh, very minimal risk inside premises. In the follow-up information that you get sent out, we'll talk about the difference between ventilation levels in a close contact premise versus premises like that where people are uh, obviously breathing out a lot more and there's a higher risk. Um, so that's aerosol transmission. In terms of for large droplets, uh, where people sneeze, cough, this is why the guidance talks about seat configuration. Because if you're sitting side by side with somebody, even if they are coughing, breathing out, the virus particles are being uh, uh, pushed in that direction away from you. Obviously, if you're back to back, it's the same. Those particles are going in different directions to the person that's breathing in. Um, so these are mitigation factors in themselves. Good ventilation could uh, be sufficient. If ventilation is good enough, that could avoid you having to have lots of screens in place. Seat configuration is another mitigation measure. Uh, when those things aren't available, this is where screens become more important. Uh, so um, hopefully that gives some proper context. Um, for aerosols, I've said ventilation is one and, and face coverings was the other, and I'll talk more detail about that later. Um, also, the follow-up information you get uh, signposted to a guidance that was done, which goes into the detail of things to think about in terms of ventilation. Essentially, we, one of the things to be mindful of and the highest risk is unventilated areas. So you might have basements, you might have uh, large rooms that people need to work in for a period of time where there's no ventilation. 
you should be trying to stop those activities where staff need to be in there for more than 30 minutes. So that's staff, uh, you know, working together. Um, toilets are another one that you, you might, uh, when we've talked about this before, businesses have said, well, we've got no basement, we've got no unventilated areas. And when we mentioned toilets, they hadn't given that consideration. Or toilets, usually you haven't always got windows. So that can be an area where there's a high risk. Some businesses open uh, doors more to try and get ventilation in there. So think about those things. Okay, now I'm going to pass over to um, Alex Wilkins from who's medical liaison from the UK Association of Professional Piercers for him to give you a feel for things that they thought about for their particular display. Now we have, uh, just while he gets ready to um, unmute himself, so that's Alex Wilkins. Uh, he... Um, on this call, we've got a range of people from hairdressers, barbers, piercing, and tattooists. It's a real mixed bag. Some of the information that he talks about may actually be relevant to every kind of close contact business. So Alex, um, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, everybody hear me okay? Am I definitely unmuted? Marvellous, lovely. Okay, so my name is Alex Wilkins. I'm a body piercer. I've been a body piercer for about seven years now, I would say. And today I'm representing the UK APP, which is the United Kingdom's Association of Professional Piercers, and I'm the medical liaison for them. Now, the UK APP is a, is a non-profit voluntary organisation, and it, it was created to kind of help promote uh, knowledge of safe piercing practices, uh, provide education for the public and for industry um, professionals alike about health and safety standards for piercing studios and for the practitioners, you know, kind of. Uh, somewhat of a guidance to kind of um, help them operate on a day to day. Uh, now, in general, for, for as a body piercer, when when the COVID um, pandemic kind of hit and the government were bringing in all these extra legislations and rules uh, for close contact businesses, uh, I personally felt that um, we as an industry were were kind of ready for it. It's uh, it's no secret that body piercers are often uh, the geeks of the body modification industry. We're definitely the ones who are obsessed with cleanliness at every possible um, juncture so we felt I felt generally that we were kind of ready for this situation. Cross-contamination has always been a very important part of our industry and everything we do generally revolves around that um, as a such. Um, so particularly with PPE when that was kind of brought in it, it really wasn't a, um, a strange concept to have uh, medical grade surface disinfectants, gloves, face masks, autoclaves, these are all pretty standard stuff that you would have in a piercing room. Um, so in, in, in terms of protection for um, employees and for practitioners and, and for the public, um, generally speaking, you would have everything that you would need. And we didn't, you, you may not have to necessarily uh, bring in a lot of different um, uh, additional products and stuff to, to do your job safely. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of close contact industries are going to have that kind of supply anyway um so it sometimes it would feel peculiar that we would be singled out um aside from uh non-essential businesses to be a particularly at risk uh industry i remember the the first lockdown as on the road out we were further along the road than other places even though generally i would say most of our industries would be far more equipped to deal with this issue than your average shop, your Tesco's, your Marks and Spencer's, something like that. Um, I feel that the, um, the biggest change um, that we kind of faced as an industry was, and many other um, industries within this uh, sector, would be the elimination of a lot of day-to-day -day routine in, in, in fa uh, facial um, procedures. So um, for us, that would be piercings on the nose or in the mouth. A lot of those kind of were sidelined pretty immediately, uh, which obviously brought a fair amount of um, financial impact onto a lot of businesses. And I'm sure a lot of your businesses have felt the kind of pinch of that, having to reduce the amount of services that you can offer um, because, of, because of this pandemic and because of this situation. So at the UK EPP, we kind of, obviously our membership is a completely voluntary thing. 
Um, but we did include a, um, a series of recommendations for our members and for non-members of our industry. Now we put these together on May 13th and I just wanna go over just a couple of them with you, just to kind of give you a sense of what we were kind of um, recommending to do on top of what we were already doing as a, as a body piercer. Um, so to touch on the, the ventilation aspect that Paul was going over, um, one thing that we've always recommended for our members is that in the, um, the procedure rooms that we would have is that there would be a, a HEPA filter in place. A HEPA filter is a high efficiency particulate filter. And what that does is it basically, it's an air filter that removes a, at least kind of 99.97%, the manufacturer says, of kind of dust, pollen, mold, bacteria, and any airborne particles. And that's within a size of around three micro, uh, 0.3 microns. So we would have them in our um, pra um, procedure rooms as generally as a standard thing. But what we found that we uh, ended up bringing in was to bring those filters as well into the reception rooms. And I feel for our industry and pro probably a lot of your industries as well, that's where the biggest change has actually uh, come about not so much how I'm doing my procedures but how I'm interacting with my clients in a reception room and a more kind of shop area I mean I personally felt safer and more COVID secure when I was doing the close contact service up like this in somebody's face than when I was just talking to them normally behind the counter I feel like in the reception areas where the most amount of changes kind of came into play because we'll talk about as well um, in the common areas keeping those areas so much cleaner than they may have ever been before and having your um, counter staff or your receptionist now having to know so much more information about close um, about uh, cross contamination and just being up on cleaning surfaces you know we were recommending that people you know card machines door handles um, any surfaces that clients were near all being kind of cleaned down with a, a medical grade disinfectant um, after every interaction, really. Um, so having your uh, receptionists and your um, counter staff kind of brought up to speed with cross contamination and when something is, is contaminated and when not. I mean, um, I feel quite lucky as a piercer. Um, I was always taught to treat every customer <laughs> like they were infected up to their eyes of every disease and virus you could possibly imagine so that I used to this not letting anyone touch anything uh, but bringing the rest of your team up to speed on those kind of issues I think is definitely an important thing and still going forward even as the pandemic generally winds down I think having your you know all of your staff brought up to speed with everything that doesn't involve doing the procedure itself but all of the um, technical aspects around it why you don't touch certain things why you wear gloves or PPE for certain things I think having your whole staff rather than just your um, procedure team up to date on that is, is invaluable um, at this time. Um, we generally, um, in my studio particularly is just a shoebox basically. So there's only really one room for one human being at a time anyway, but we really kind of stress that to our clients that we would be taking appointments only for the foreseeable, just to stop the amount of human, Human trafficking might be a, a, a wrong word to use, but um, this, the, the amount of humans in and out of the studio at any one time, we really wanted to limit that down as much as possible. So we switched over to appointments only, and we recommended that for a lot of other piercers as well as the, the, as the UK APP. Um, it also means that you can actually clean after all of these clients. I mean, you've got them in and out, and if you've got other people coming in asking questions, um queries and things it's just it's more stuff to clean it's more things to get your head around and keep on top of and, you, and it, it's unnecessary so trying to limit to appointments only even you know the rise of the zoom call i think we've also been in my studio personally um consultations troubleshooting things of that nature where i would usually tell people come on in i'll have a look at it now i only want to do that stuff out over zoom and then i'll decide if i actually need to be face to face with that client so just anything to reduce the amount of contact with other people down as much as possible now we actually released a um uh, a system of work kind of covid19 procedure manual and an action plan and we wanted something like that to kind of be written for every studio 
because again, it's not just your um, your piercers, your tattooists, hairdressers dealing with these issues. It's your whole team. So everyone needs to be on the same wavelength about what they're doing, how they're operating, um, and and things of that nature. So I think having a a book written down, a guidelines for all of your staff, so that everyone's on the same page, so that each client is getting a similar safe. Um, kind of uh, procedure performed and treatment every time they come in, no matter who they're with. Um, we also, obviously, a big one was face coverings. Uh, and I'm sure you've had many uh, encounters with many clients who have their own opinions on whether they should be wearing a face covering or not. But generally speaking, uh, we recommended, obviously, pe people uh, performing the procedures, face masks on whilst they're talking to the clients in general. And of course, when they're doing procedures, but also the clients wearing them at all times as well because it's not just I think we uh, you can easily get wrapped up in your own safety but it's it, you know uh, all of this stuff is a two-way street so I think um really having that is it was an important step um to kind of keep everybody safe um yeah I've already covered that um and of course the 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 other one that is prevalent in so many businesses now is you know, hands being, uh, clients uh, kind of adhering to the same kind of um, hygiene guidelines that we would uh, uh, frequently have to kind of go with. So hand washing, hand sanitizing for clients kind of in and out of um, spaces, just to try and do whatever you can to kind of um, limit those, uh, those interactions. Um, we're trying to work our best with uh, kind of um, RSP going forward. Because we really want to kind of establish a set of regulations um, across the UK. There's been work in Wales done to kind of bring everyone in that in in our industry at least up to a certain standard. Um, and we ideally we want this kind of information and these kind of standards to be set throughout our industry um, across the UK, not just in certain aspects of it. So uh, going forward, we're kind of looking to work with RSB to kind of make that a sort to sort of normalize everything within our industry so that everyone's on a, the same playing field and people aren't getting too left behind. Um, that pretty much sums up uh, most of what I wanted to say, Paul. I don't know if you want me to cover anything else particularly. Alex, that's excellent. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so PP, we've talked about, um, there's been questions in the past about, you know, do I need to wear visors and face coverings? If I've got a visor or goggles, does that mean I don't need to face covering on? Um, now we know that virus particles are coming out uh, when we breathe and talk. That's why it's important that you still have a face covering, not simply a visor, because the visor just doesn't do anything to stop the particles being breathed out or breathed in by, by others uh, around you. Um, effectiveness of face coverings, I won't dwell on this, just to say there's a huge difference between uh, certain materials. Again, that's in the follow-up information. Um, we've had questions about staff testing. Uh, so for employees, anybody can go onto this government website and find out about the, the lateral flow tests. Employers can also order tests themselves. There's some free tests going from uh, government. And uh, even when that finishes, there's an there's, uh, opportunity to buy it privately. Um, it's important to bear in mind that viral load is, you know, is one of the things to think about in terms of how infectious somebody is. Uh, why do we say that? Because we've, uh, you know, you would have heard about PCR tests or LFT. PCR tests are super sensitive. Some tests done by authorities in another country found of 90% of people who were positive with a PCR test, 90% um, of them had barely any virus uh, within the body. So there weren't actually a transmission risk. Um, this is why it's important to, to look towards the lateral flow test, which the World Health Organization says is a lot better test to uh, get into measure the viral load when somebody's at their most uh, infectious uh, state of being infectious to others. Uh, mental health is, is something we were asked to, to cover um, in a normal year. One in four of us are experiencing mental health problems. Uh, the mental health charities are saying we're going through a mental health epidemic at the moment. There's lots of 
start some studies out there looking at the effect that the lockdown and the virus uh, and um, the kind of fear that we, you know, we've all been experiencing for what 15 months now and the effect that's having on different types of people. Um, in terms of you as a business owner, uh, employees, uh, a work uh, a, a survey found just under half of employees said that mental health was, uh, has got worse since the coronavirus outbreak. I would just highlight that that was a work a sort of employer related survey. Not everybody would be comfortable telling their employer that they're, they don't feel their mental health is up to scratch. When you look at surveys taken outside employment and employment related trade associations, I think we get a clearer picture, you know, almost 80% of men seem to suffer from anxiety, stress. Almost half of them won't talk to anybody. That's, that's normal for mental health. 90% of working mums the past year said uh, their mental health has been impacted um, by this increased stress and anxiety. Now, these men and women might be in your workplace and they won't always feel comfortable telling you as an employer that they're struggling. Uh, it's really important to be mindful of this and think about mental health in the, in the workplace. Um, the biggest survey of mental health, 70 odd thousand people. So it's pretty significant in terms of the, you know, its application across uh, wider context across the UK. Half of them seeing they're anxious about returning to the workplace. Lots of people talking about job insecurity fears. What they found is consultation helps, you know, talking to staff, telling them about the safety measures you put in place to keep them safe is helpful. Um, and talk to them about, you know, how things will work when they come back to work. Now, obviously, as a person running the business, you looking after your own health is, is a key factor. Um, you know, it can be, uh, we're, I'd imagine as a business owner, you've got so much things on your plate trying to work out how to keep the business going and survive. You might not have to give yourself the time to really think uh, and reflect on how you're feeling yourself. So it's important to be, you know, really mindful of this. Uh, lots of, you know, mixes of businesses and citizens that we speak to talk about the concerns that they have about themselves, about family and friends, fears around the virus. Um, and, you know, we've all seen, you know, a lot of this over a year in the media uh, where there's a lot of fear around this. So it's important to kind of, you know, get some context. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I want to share with you is that, um, you know, the, the latest uh, official figures from government is that the average age of somebody dying of COVID is 82 and a half. And the average age of somebody uh, dying in the UK is 81. So it is, you know, you may remember right at the beginning of this, we were told that people at most risk are the vulnerable, those with underlying conditions. As media stories progressed, we heard more and more stories about people in their 40s, people that seem to be fit, dying. And these are the kind of fears that have come out uh, when we're talk we're, you know, hearing from uh, different businesses. So it's important to have some context that it is still the case that it is the, the most vulnerable um, who are affected by this. 99.9.5% of people of all ages will not suffer serious, will not have serious um, uh, health uh, illness if they have the virus. Um, it's rough, just over 500 people of working age who haven't got an underlying condition uh, died in, in the uh, March until January. So, you know, the virus is, is a problem. It, it is affecting lots of people, but having that perspective can hopefully, uh, you know, leave some of your concerns so you can really focus all of your attention on running your business and making things successful. We'll send some, include this uh, in the follow-up information that gets sent, info at contacts groups, other information that will help you put in place proper processes um, in your workplace to make sure you and all your staff uh, help help in their mental health so they can be as uh, you know productive as they can be when uh, they're at uh, at the workplace. Um, vaccination uh, and it was another uh, query that we got. Business, you, you'll you'll see in different business sectors worried about and kind of asking questions around 
whether or not they should have some sort of uh, policies themselves around staff vaccinations or uh, measures in terms of how we deal with customers when we reopen. Um, this is something some sectors are already asking these questions and thinking about implementing their own measures. Uh, so this, these questions uh, are, are maybe going through your own minds when you reopen. So two things really, one is, um, you know, the, this uh, comprehensive survey I mentioned, 70,000 people, uh, between 19 and 29% of adults between 18 and 60 said they were feeling uh, that they may, they do not want to take the virus, the, the vaccine, sorry. So there will, there's still a lot of uncertainty at the moment. You need to be mindful of that if you did think about having some sort of policy uh, insisting that staff have the vaccination. This is not something we can, we're going to get into in a deep dive here. There is some ACAS advice, which I'll signpost you to, which basically, you know, talks about the things that you need to think about. Um, if you brought in certain policies, there is risks of, uh, uh, you know, um, it breaching Human Rights Act or Discrimination Act. So that is something to be mindful of. And that's a similar thing if you thought about whether to bring in a policy for customers, you know, insisting that people are only who are only vaccinated can come to the premise. Now, to put your mind at rest, this question that are in the business uh, sector has been considered by government. There was a two week review that just ended a few weeks ago. Government uh, was looking at this very question and they are looking at the ethical and legal ramifications of uh, businesses having those kind of policies or having some kind of national policy about vaccination. Um, you may have heard it's already been looked at in terms of uh, the theater and event sectors, you know, where people will either have to have the vaccination or a test certificate showing that uh, they have the antibodies, that they're not at risk. So these things are being considered at national level. So the, the advice would really be, you know, don't jump the gun and, and implement your own policies yet. Wait to see what comes out of that. Um, these are a range of uh, issues, questions that came up that were sent in by businesses that register today. So we'll just go through these um, before I then pass on to my colleague, uh, and then we'll be opening up to FAQs to, for any other questions that we might have missed. So a uh, question around mobile visits to clients' homes. Well, there is an other people's homes guidance, which talks about uh, things like think about face coverings, ventilation. I think one of the most important things uh, whenever you're going into people's homes, whatever sector you're in is advanced communication with your customer. Um, the more information that you can give your customer up front, the better. So if you tell them to think about ventilation, opening windows, doors, you know, half an hour or so before you turn up, that will save an awkward conversation when you get into the house. Um, is there a maximum treatment time? Um, there is nothing set down in law. There was, uh, uh, you know, various bits of guidance. I think at one stage in the close contact guidance, the, there was guidance saying try and keep treatments under one hour. There's nothing, there's no hard and fast rule about this because there's so many factors that affect the risk of transmission, time around the person, how well ventilated the room is. Um, is uh, so for, for most, um, well, let, let's give you one example relevant to your sector. So there was um, a study looking at uh, two people at a hair salon, two members of staff who had tested positive for COVID-19 they saw around 190 clients, the client and the staff were wearing face coverings, and um, none of those 190 clients uh, were tested positive for the uh, virus. So that was clients who were seeing between 15 and 45 minute treatments. Uh, uh, and so this, this was pushed out uh, to, um, to highlight the the usefulness of wearing face coverings because obviously if you wear good face coverings you and the member of staff um, you could be around that person longer because a higher percentage of those virus uh, containing droplets would get contained within the, the, the mask rather than get breathed out so no hard for fast rule but that should give you an indication of you know roughly where you need to be if, if you're doing treatments more than one hour you need to think uh, about uh, ventilation. So, for example, 
I mean, this ties in with the other question we had, safe time limits between clients. So um, again, lots of different uh, numbers came around initially, going back a year, 50 minutes, 30 minutes, there was a lot of uncertainty. I think as things are a little bit clearer now. So the advice that Sage and PHE uh, looked at with the gym sector, looked at 10 minute window between big classes, 10 minutes, um, opening windows for 10 minutes every hour for offices was the, is the latest stage advice. Um, are there any government guidelines when we can return back to normal? Uh, various things to think. Uh, obviously, we've got the government roadmap, which is talking about after July, things getting back to normal. Um, but you would have seen that there's um, comments made by uh, uh, Sir Patrick Valence and Witty that um, every winter, at least for the next few years, we might still see certain measures like wearing masks, social distancing, um, uh, and they were talking about in, thinking about being sensible with interactions and indoors. Um, one of the concerns that was raised about the third wave, um, so I guess some reassurance that businesses can have is that 99% of the people most at risk um, for, of dying of COVID have been vaccinated. So that goes some way to suggest that more lockdowns may not occur after July. Um, so those, um, oh, the other question we had about was about microblading. Well, there was a restriction back in August-ish where there was no uh, face treatments allowed. That rule, that guidance doesn't exist now. So contact services are being told, wear face coverings unless the treatment requires you to remove the face covering. Okay, so it's all about managing and minimizing those risks. So that would involve you training your staff to be mindful of those things. Um, we had, we're not doing a gym webinar. So a gym uh, did ask a question of, uh, in terms of class sizes, when gyms reopen, uh, initially exercise classes are banned, uh, is what Boris Johnson said. Although I, it's uh, when we go to step two in I think it was 17th of May then actually cl size classes are allowed to to restart um oh and the other one that I missed up there is client refusal to wear masks because of medical exemption yet they don't provide evidence of that uh so two things here is one um the law says you, they don't have to provide evidence of that that's tied in with a you know, kind of discrimination rules. That's why that came about. And the other thing is to bear in mind the low risk if the person is, uh, you know, under, uh, you know, is under 70, hasn't got underlying conditions. The risks are very low, as I touched upon in the earlier slide. So in a situation like that, the practical things you can do is ventilation. Yeah. And minimizing time around those clients. OK, I'm going to pass you over to Ravina. Uh, he'll talk about risk assessment in, in a bit more detail. Uh, we're probably going to be maybe 10, 15 minutes and we'll be wrapped up at our end and then it'll be over to yourself. So any questions, start thinking about them now and, and get them in the chat uh, in it too. Thanks. Hi, yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, so my name is Ravina Purawal and I work for the RSP as an environmental health officer. Um, so I'll just go for a few points now, but I'm, I am mindful of the time and that we want to have time for questions, so I'll be as quick as I can. Um, so I'll start with risk assessments. Um, as an employer, you have a legal responsibility to protect your workers and others from risk to their health and safety. So this this would include the risk from COVID-19. So in order, so COVID-19 is a hazard in the workplace, so just as just like other hazards. So working from high slips and trips, um, you should manage health COVID-19 in the same way. So that would involve completing a suitable and sufficient assessment of the risks of COVID-19, which is a COVID-19 risk assessment. If you have more than five employees, you must record the findings of your risk assessment. And if you have fewer than five employees, there's no legal requirement for you to write anything down, but you might want to write, you might find it helpful to write something down. Um, there's a lot of guidance available on the HSC website about how to um, complete a risk assessment and what kind of um, things you need to consider when carrying out a risk assessment and we also have a link on the Merton website to and I'm sure Richmond and Wands of websites have it as well a link to a template risk risk assessment which you can complete and um, so next slide slide please Paul 
Um, so this is from a from the HSE website from a document called what to include in your COVID-19 risk assessment. So it's just a small section. So as you can see um, at the beginning, it says, what are the hazards? So there's plenty of different hazards that could be, but this one we're talking about on this slide is just getting or spreading coronavirus by not washing hands or not washing them adequately. So then it talks about who and who might be harmed, so it's workers, customers, contractors, etc. And then you talk about the control measures so this is what you need to think about. So you need to think about if people aren't washing their hands, what can I do to make them wash their hands? So make sure I've got posters in advising people what to do. Make sure I've got enough wash hand basins with a supply of soap and hygienic hand drying facilities and um, also providing hand sanitizer. And then it just gives you um, another section on what further action do I need to put in place? So um i just talked about the signage but also monitoring um it maybe every morning doing a check on the hand sanitizers and the soaps to make sure they're all tapped up um but this is just a small example and there's a lot more detail um on the hsc website in particular this document i would point you towards which is what to include in your covid19 risk assessment uh, next slide please so now we'll talk about the nhs test and trace um system slash qr codes so this is the webinar for the close contact services to so the beauty so the barbers, the hairdressers, the nail salons, and it's a legal requirement for all your businesses to display this poster. Um, you probably already have one because this was introduced last September, but if you don't, you can go on the gov.uk website and obtain an NHS QR code poster. Your old QR code posters will work, but the government are encouraging you to go on the website and get a new poster because the new poster is slightly more updated and they've got a bit more information on there for customers as well. Um, next slide, please. So um, we had this question just in the chat. So what, what do we have to do essentially? So e every customer or visitor age 16 and over must check into your venue. So they can do this by simply, if they've got the NHS COVID-19 app on their phone, they can simply scan your NHS QR code poster and check into the venue. However, you must also have a system in place to ensure that you can collect information from your customers or visitors who don't have a smartphone or who do not wish to use the NHS COVID-19 app. So this could involve having a, a slip of paper that they write it out on or you keep it in a book or something like that. Um, and you must keep this data for 21 days and provide it to NHS Test and Trace if requested. But if a customer has already scanned the NHS QR code poster, there's no requirement for you to then again take their details by writing it down that's just a backup measure if for, if they don't have a smartphone um, or their batteries died or anything like that so that's for customers and visitors and for in terms of your staff um, you must keep a record of all staff working on the premises and their shift times on a given day and also their contact details um, and the next slide is just appli applicable to retail so I won't cover that so next slide please um, so this is um, Paul has covered this already pretty much, but I'll just go over it once more because it's quite important. Um, I work primarily in Wandsworth, but I do cover Richmond and Merton as well. And last year we had a lot of problems with this. So just as a reminder, the person providing the service of so the hairdresser or the beautician um, should be wearing a type 2 face mask and then and on top of the face mask, either to protect their eyes, either a clear visor or eye goggles. Um, and then any other staff who are not in close contact, so for example, a receptionist or a cleaner, and also customers should wear a face covering. Um, Paul also covered this. Um, customers do not should also always keep their face covering on, um, but if they need to remove their face covering as part of the treatment, so for example, they're getting their beard trimmed or anything like that, they can remove it and then put it on straight away after once the treatment's completed. Um, by law, businesses must remind customers to wear a face covering where they are required. This could be done by using signage or providing verbal reminders. And in terms of staff being exempt um, from wearing a face, a face mask and visor or goggles, as part of your risk assessment, you should consider this. What can I do to then protect my staff if they can't wear a face covering um, and then visor or goggles? you should maybe try and get them to work in a different role if they can do or think about the type of treatments they're carrying out. So if you're, say, for example, you're working in a, a barber's, you should avoid maybe doing the beard trims because then that would be coming in 
in face-to-face -face contact but for example if you're trimming somebody's hair where you're kind of looking at not not in contact direct contact with their face that would be a bit better and also to prevent complaints from members of the public and also make members of the public feel more secure you can try and get your mem staff to wear a badge advising customers that they're exempt um uh, next slide please so that's retail we don't need to cover that now um so this is pretty much bring, bringing consumers back giving them the confidence to come back um so on the government website is this covid secure poster so you've gone through the five steps <coughs> sorry um of the poster for example it's risk assessment you have in proper cleaning hand washing procedures and a few other points you can fill out this poster and put it on display at the front of the premises to make customers feel more confident uh, next slide please um, and this is just an example some photographs of the poster as you can see that's not in a great place nobody can see it so you want this to be on display for customers to help them feel more confident uh, next slide please um, and also on your website you can provide some more information um, on the steps that you're taking to ensure the safety of your clients for example reduced appointment capacity heightened cleaning staff temperature taking you can also post your risk assessment on the website if you wish to um, you might want to start getting anonymous feedback from your customers after their visits on what they um, and what they anything that you can improve I've really on really during the visit next slide please um so financial support is not really our, our area of expertise so you should go on the government website can provide you with a lot of guidance or also the individual council merton richmond or ones with websites as well you'll be able to get some further information um, and i think that's me done all right uh Thanks very much, Ravina. So the only thing I'll just mention the financial support, you um, there is something called the Restart Grant. So have a look at that between 6,000 and 18,000 pound available to different business sectors to help you reopen uh, and go some way to cover, you know, the previous, uh, you know, year of costs that you've built up in terms of rent and everything else. So have a look at that Restart Grant. Um, and um, the other thing I'll just say on, on ending is, uh, as I say, this has gone on online. Uh, it may be, you may be a business based outside of Wandsworth, Richmond or Merton. Uh, we just cover those three boroughs. If you're based outside the area, contact your local authorities, Environment Health Department, if you've got more questions uh, or need clarity on any of this. Okay, so, uh, I think that's it. It's over uh, to you to you guys. If you've got any questions, you can raise your hands if you want to, to speak them or uh, mention it in the chat uh, and we'll do our best to answer those. While you're thinking about your questions, uh, we'll have a look at what's in the chat already and pick up those a couple of ones that we haven't covered just yet. So uh, there was a question about NHS test and trace requirements. Hopefully, uh, Rubina's already picked that up. Uh, and, and bear in mind, it obviously there's a limit to what detail we can go into for any of this. This is why we're going to send uh, circulate a document to everybody that's registered. So you'll have a link to the uh, recording. You'll also be able to do a dive. You know, if you really want to get into the detail about anything that we've discussed there, you'll get links to more information. Uh, on that. Uh, so um, that question I think is covered. Uh, do hairdressers still have to wear visors or can we just wear masks? I, I think that one was covered as well that, um, you know, the face coverings is, you know, definite for the aerosols that we mentioned. Uh, visors are, are there to protect you, the member of staff, um, in case the uh, customer coughs sneezes in your direction so is it there to give you some protection because there was uh some thinking that there was a risk of uh, transmission when particles uh get coughed and they land on your member of staff size so it's about that's the reason behind that so it's it's for your benefit although do bear in mind it's not just visors those big visors i know that's a problem in terms of 
uh, fogging up has been reported. You can wear uh, goggles instead. Uh, so you still get eye protection, but you haven't got the, the fogging up problems. Um, providing treatments done in a room with open windows or HEPA uh, filters, do we still need to provide some sort of time in between clients? So on the point of HEPA filters, um, you know, there's a lot of HEPA filters out there online and there's huge differences in the effectiveness of them. Now, obviously, if you think about airplanes, you can't open windows there, um, but those are, you know, industrial strength uh, HEPA filters that are, you know, meet certain uh, levels. The ones that you get on the market, um, you know, unless they've been independently tested, it's really hit or miss whether you're getting a quality product. So whilst it might be sold as HEPA filter that's, you know, sold as a HEPA quality filter that blocks 99.9% .9 of uh, virus particles, etc. Unfortunately, um, as is always the case, there's loads of fraud online and there's no exception the past year. We've seen a lot of scams relating to the virus, whether it's face masks, uh, quick fixes to uh, build up your immune system and I would expect HEPA type purifiers are in a similar boat so do look for ones that have been independently tested that's one thing on HEPA and in terms of the more general question about ventilation the law doesn't dict uh, correct me if I'm wrong here Ravina the law doesn't dictate uh, about you uh, that you must have a time period between certain clients but you are legally obliged as an employer to do a risk assessment, part of which is considering how you minimize risks from one customer to the next. And the government guidance is effectively providing practical information on how you do that. And one of those is leaving a gap between clients is a way that you can minimize that risk. Um, if client one has the virus uh, and they breathe it out, and then client two comes in. Now, I, as I say, there's no hard and fast rules. Um, it's the 10 minutes is the advice that was given in different contexts. So that's a good guide to go by. Um, so it, it is better to leave at least 10 minutes between clients is what I would say. Um, the question about appointment diary, if the appointment diary has got all the client details, is that sufficient? So some, um, some businesses, uh, you and more and more sectors now, the client has to book by appointment only. So typically they would have went online and filled in some information, or you may have taken a call and you've, you've, you've essentially entered that information onto your own system. As long as you have a record, you need to have a record for 21 days then that uh, meets the track and trace requirements. Again, I'll pass to Ravina because she's just been on a course for this. Uh, tell me if uh, there has um, been some latest changes on that. Yeah, so if if they've got the, so the details you need to record, if somebody hasn't scanned in the app, would be um, their name, contact number, and the date, date and time of their, um, of their appointment, really. And ideally, if you can, it would be good to record um, in a closed contact service the name of the person who provided their service. So, um, but that's just an extra idea, which, but as long as from your appointment diary, if it's on your laptop or on your computer, you can easily pull off this data to give it to NHS Test and Trace if they asked for it. I think that would be, that would be completely fine. Um, a, a fine way of, of keeping the, the data. Yeah. Um, and also, I know there's a quick notice to question on lateral flow testing. Um, and you said that you're a smaller salon, so you don't think you're eligible. So just as a reminder, businesses with more, um, let me just get the, my slot, my notes up so I don't get anything wrong. Um, you can order la la rapid lateral flow tests to test employees with no coronavirus symptoms. The tests are entirely free of charge until the, until, until the 30th of June for businesses that register by the 12th of April 2021. So you've only got a few days left to register. I'll put the link in the um, in the chat, um, and you can only register if you've got mo more than ten employees. So if you're a smaller business, which a lot of you would be, and you've got less than ten employees, um, 
you can look into the community testing, which is, I'll also provide the links to this, the Merton, Richmond and Wandsworth Council. Um, you can go onto the website and book a test. Um, so it won't be something you'll be able to do in-house. So a member of staff would have to firstly go to the testing centre and get their test and then come into work. But it's still a way of you getting um, staff to get lateral flow tests. So I'll put all that information in the chat um, so you've got it. OK, I'll just mention this because it might be on other people's minds. Uh, do massage therapists need to wear gloves and aprons? No legal requirement for that. Uh, and on the point about gloves, uh, you, you'll be aware there was a, you, you know, Scotland was saying don't wear gloves. English guidance was saying do wear gloves. Uh, and the, the kind of, it's, there may have been some confusion around that. The thinking was that by wearing gloves, it gives a false sense of security and people may be less inclined to wash hands as regularly. Uh, so that is why it's recommended not to wear gloves. Looking through the rest of the messages, we've got another 12 queries here. Um, okay, is it true that staff, uh, if a staff is exempt from wearing face covering, they can't carry out services? Now, when the guidance recommends that staff who are exempt uh, move to uh, jobs where they're not in close contact with customers. Uh, Ravina, that was only guidance, wasn't it? Obviously, because there's so many practical difficulties, depending on your business, you may not have the luxury of being able to move those staff to another side of the business. Um, yeah. So it's guidance. You need to take all reasonable measures to reduce the risk. That's the thing to think about with any of these things. Uh, do you call your local authority for a restart grant? Yes, those are that money's being sent to local authorities to to con to circulate on behalf of um, central government. So contact them. Um, when you contact the local authority, um, and just first of all, you know, Google that, and you, usually you'll get the link, the information, probably an application form. What we'll do is we'll send that in the follow up. Yeah. So um, if we as much as possible for each council, we'll try and give the direct link to the application for restart grant. A few of my team wear glasses. Can they wear these instead of goggles and shields? So uh, I, again, I think the, the, the guidance to wear goggles and shears, shields is guidance. So obviously if you're staff are wearing uh, spectacles, uh, they may be unable to then put goggles on top, but your staff will still have, uh, you know, some benefit from their eyes being covered in that scenario. Is the best protection when doing massage? Um, I assume that question is, what's the best protection when doing massage? So the things to think about is uh, with massage, you know, that would typically, you'd be with a client much longer than, you know, many other close contact services. Um, you will say that here, you can be in a hair salon for a few hours as well. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, massage is, is the same as every other close contact service in terms of face coverings. If you're doing a facial massage, the, the guidance that we talked about earlier applies, you need to uh, minimize removing the mask until you get to a stage in the treatment where you have to remove the mask. And when you're doing that, you're minimizing the time uh, that that, uh, that that occurs. And you're thinking about, you know, ventilation as you're doing it. I'm not sure if there's anything more specific you had in mind, the person that asked that. If, if I've missed anything, then raise your hand or, uh, again, clarify the or add more detail in the chat. Lateral flow test, yes, uh, Ravina has answered that question. Do we, need, do we still need to disinfect areas after every use? Uh, so normal hand washing, uh, you know, normal hy hygiene practices should still apply. Normal cleaning practices should still apply. So if you, before COVID, if you always sterilize certain equipment because you thought that was the, required to keep people safe, you still do that. Um, what what I'm what I've said earlier is that now we know volumic transmission is virtually impossible. Excessive cleaning 
is no longer required. Yeah. Okay. Um, I goggles query. Lana, this has been copied. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, this question from Lana's iPhone and how often do staff take lateral flow tests? It is recommended that um that the private sector employees take a lateral flow test twice a week, but there's no again there's no legal requirement or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. And and when you think about lateral flow tests, look at that um, information that came up in the slide. You know the the kind of what who were saying about that in terms of. A positive result can come up, you know, two days before somebody um, is at the most infectious and, you know, three, four days after uh, the main period of infection. So that might be a fact in your thinking, how often you want to do that. I goggle queries. This has been copied from the guidance. OK, that's actually uh, my colleague answering that question. Next one. Is a fan adequate for a room with no windows? So. Um, again, we'll give the detail about fans and air conditioning. There's something to be mindful of with air con, so do read that guidance before you uh, you switch on your air con at, at work. But essentially, what you're trying to do is, by any means possible, you're trying to increase the amount of ventilation in a space. Now, uh, you know, we've been asked lots of questions around this. You know, do I need to open all the windows at the front and the back of the premise? You know, it's so difficult to give hard and fast rules about this, which is why that, um, um, you know, it's, it, you know, essentially it's, it's, um, it's almost like the, you know, the finger test, you, you wet your finger, can you feel a, a breeze coming through, that's a, a good example, a very rough rule of thumb of the ventilation is probably good in that premise. Unless you buy a carbon dioxide monitor, you're not getting a you know, a real kind of hard and fast rule, how good the ventilation is in your premise. But, um, you know, to, to give you a kind of rough idea, when visits were made by local authorities to a range of, you know, pubs um, and um, uh, close contact uh, sector businesses, where a number of windows were open, uh, you know, the ventilation was under that 1000 you know ppm that I mentioned a good ventilation the problems were only really being found in businesses where for, for whatever reason the business was not opening windows and doors for a long time there was no um you know there was some premises had no windows doors open some had only a very tiny window open so the, you know there wasn't really uh reasonable steps being taken by those businesses to, to increase the ventilation so it's you know as, as long as you uh can feel a breeze in if you're in a area of the room where there's corridors you can't get windows you can't get breeze in fans can help circulate uh and dilute the, the air in those areas and air con can play a function as well if you've got a space where it's uh, poorly ventilated this is why leaving a period of time between clients also helps. So it gives enough time. If you haven't got fans or air con, it gives enough time to dilute virus particles in that area. Um, if a client calls to say they have COVID after a visit, not from the salon, do we only isolate if we get contacted by track and trace? So, um, Ravina, do you want to pick that one up if you if you can, yeah. or pick it so up? So, if, if somebody contacts you, um, if it's a member of staff who's got symptoms, the first thing you should say is um, stay at home and get a test. And um, if somebody contacts you saying I went, came into your premises and I've now got symptoms or I've now tested positive, um, if they've got symptoms, you need to advise them to get a test. And then NHS Test and Trace will contact you if you need to isolate, or if you need, to, or if you, some of your staff need to. I was like the NHS test and trace will contact you so there's two kind of alerts you'll get through the app um, and and one of them is a more of an informative message saying you've been at a premises they'll never name the premises for um business for different reasons they'll never say you visited McDonald's in Tooting or anything like that um they'll say you, you visited a premises where people have tested positive and this is just a message to inform you um to be more mindful and 
make sure you're washing your hands more, make sure you are social distancing, social distancing at all times and just be bear in mind and watch out for the symptoms, loss of taste, etc. And there's a separate message which, which would be to go book a test immediately and then go and buy, then if you get a positive test, then you would need to isolate and so would your household. But in terms of isolating or anything like that, then you don't need to do it until NHS test and trace have contacted you. If you are concerned that somebody has rang you up, say, two days ago, and you've not heard from NHS test and trace, then drop us an email at foodandsafety at merton.gov.uk and we can see what we do. But I doubt that situation would arise. I'm sure NHS test and trace would get in contact with you. Um, yeah. And I just add, um, remember what I mentioned, or I appreciate we whizzed through a lot of information, but in a scenario where two members of staff actually tested positive for COVID, they did, and they were everybody was wearing face coverings, they did not pass that on to 190 clients that passed through the salon. So even if somebody with COVID has come in, as long as you are doing all these reasonable things, ventilation, face coverings, it, you know, you, you are doing the steps that minimise the risk of that being passed around others uh, within the salon. Yeah. In terms of leaving time in between clients, another thing that was mentioned uh, in the chat is uh, uh, contact time at surface disinfectants and other cleaning products take to take effect. For example, if you clean a door handle, it needs five minutes to fully take effect. How often do staff take lateral flow tests? We've answered that. Um, in regards to refreshments, if a client asks for tea water, do we have to use disposable cups? Um, no, just standard. Uh, cleaning, hygiene, just standard washing of uh, a mug uh, as you would pre-COVID is, is fine. And then there's some various information that we've added in terms of links to lateral flow tests in the chat. So it's in the chat and also it will appear in the follow-up information that we send through. When group classes are able to restart in gyms, which I believe 17th of May, uh, will there be restriction on class sizes still? I, I, I don't believe that detail came up in what was sent out with the roadmap. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone. Um, so uh, we cannot say for sure at this stage. You know, everything Boris Johnson was saying is about this permanent reopening and this is why everything's been done very slowly step by step so everything that they are suggesting is that this is going to be a you know us getting back to normal uh, so if that is the uh, you know the thinking then uh, i would assume there isn't restriction on class sizes but it's a case of keeping uh, abreast of changes not just in your close contact the guidance but if you're a gym i would look at your uk active is really on the ball. They've they are quite switched on. Their their representatives talk to people within uh, Bays, and so as soon as central government have made a decision, UK Active will have something on their website. So that's the, the place I would go to probably see the first information around class sizes. Uh, also in the chat, there's links to restart grants. So thank you very much, Angela, for that. Um, Another point in terms of leaving time in between clients. Uh, oh yeah, I've uh, mentioned that one. Okay. Uh, oh, the, the current government guidance. Yeah, okay, that's somebody, and uh, my colleague answering a question on that. Uh, is it still only a maximum of six people inside the premise including staff and customers. And um, the other question, can I offer a drink in the salon? So the drink I've already answered. Ravina, do you want to pick up that one about the six people? Yep. Um, so what you're probably referring to there, and a lot of businesses have got confused with this, is the rule of six. So this refers to six friends or six individuals meeting up and going into a, a bar or a restaurant um, outdoors obviously from the 12th or meeting in a park say from the 29th um, in terms of the capacity of your premises it's up to you to determine this when carrying out your risk assessment so it's a lot easier for a salon for any kind of beauty salon close contact service it service so you should position the chairs in such a way that there is a um, two meter so two meter distance or one meter if you've put further risk mitigation measures in place 
such as a screen um, or having side to side seating or you've got other measures like face covering and ventilation. Um, so, for example, if you've got a very quite a big premises and say you've got 10 chairs and you determine that you're able to use every other chair, you might be allowed to have five people in. Um, so it just it just pretty much depends on your premises and your risk assessment. But there's no maximum that you're allowed or minimum. Not, well, there wouldn't be a minimum. Sorry. There's no maximum in terms of the law. It's up to you to determine that in your risk assessment, how you're going to safely allow people in um, while um, adhering to the social distancing rules. And I know Paul, I think I must have missed this, but I know Paul just said he covered the canal for a drink in the salon. Um, there's no, there's no, nowhere in the guidance or the law that says that you cannot. But a good thing to bear in mind is if you are offering people uh, hot drinks and things like that, um, that they will keep taking their mask off. So it's something, something to consider because um, you don't want, that defeats the object of wearing a mask if they've constantly got it off to have a drink. Um, so that's something you might want to think about. Um, but yeah, I'm going to put the, email address in the chat. I did put a link to the guidance earlier on, the close contact services guidance on the government website. Um, if you can't find the link, you can just pretty much Google um, gov.uk COVID-19 guidance for close contact services and um, and you'll be able to find it. I've also put the links to all, everything about lateral flow testing. And I do strongly recommend if you have got more than 10 employees that by the 12th of April to sign up for that and you've got free tests then till the 30th of June. Um, I'll also put our email address in if you need any th further help after this um, after this webinar. Don't, do not hesitate to contact us, and we're here to help you at the end of the day. So I primarily work in Wandsworth, but there's colleagues doing my role, which you might have come across before, Maria Dane in the Merton and Sean Case in Richmond, and we are we are here to help you. So, um, so please get in contact with us if you need any help. And I'll pass it back to Paul. Yeah, great. Is there any uh, anybody want to ask a question? If you want to uh, say your question verbally, just raise your hand, and you can you can be uh, unmuted. Oh, we've, uh, just had, we've just had something <laughs> yeah, about, about customers' temperatures. Yeah. Um, if you if you wish to, you can. Um, last summer, I know various restaurants, etc., were taking customer temperatures. It's not a legal requirement. And so then if you if you were taking customer temperatures and somebody refused to, um, you can't force them. To, you can't really force them. There's no legal requirement to say that before entering a, a barber's or a nail salon that you have to have your temperature checked and it has to be below this figure. So you can choose to if you wish to as part of your arm control measures. Um, you might choose to take staff temperatures every day, but there's no legal requirement for you to do so. Excellent. Any uh, any last qu questions before we wrap up? Um, I hope we're hoping to uh, get the information round. Um, people have asked about recording of the of the webinar. Um, I, I don't know, Ellie or anybody else on the call. Do we know when we expect to get it live on the website? Um, and in terms of the document. I'm hoping in a, a week, 10 days tops, we'll send that follow-up information, which has uh, you know, all the links to, to all this information in more detail. Um, but yeah, in terms of the recording, do we, do we know when that's gonna be live? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, we will have the links on the Richmond website uh, within the next couple of days, um, by Monday, the latest. Um, the I can't talk on behalf of the other local authorities, um, but it will certainly the links will certainly be sent to uh, to Wandsworth and Merton comms teams um, to place on their website. Right, so it'll be there. You go. So it'll be on Richmond's with a, by by Monday. So you can you can have a look there, uh, and the other the other councils will follow thereafter. So yeah, within a within a week you should get that, and also. Uh, there are very shortly afterwards the, the follow up document. Uh, all right, if there's no more questions uh, or any, is any other points, uh, Elizabeth, or any, any of my other colleagues, anything else you guys would have mentioned before we wrap up? Or, or Alex from uh, UKPP, if anybody's got last minute comments, uh, I'll, I'll open the floor to you guys. No. Okay, great. Well, 
thank you uh, for everybody that for Marsby that helped uh, out today. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, any questions ha uh, that come out after today, just uh, send them to that email address that appears within the chat. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, bye.